live strong. I'd like to welcome you all to this important Live Strong Roundtable discussion on a conversation about body acceptance and self-love. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here for this essential topic. In case you haven't all met each other, I'd like to go around and introduce you to each other because you're a fabulous group of women who inspire me daily. First, let's start with you, Anna Victoria. You're the creator of the Body Love app. You've helped thousands of women to get healthy and strong, and you encourage them to post candid photos of themselves on Instagram, even if there are imperfections. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for having me. Next, Cassie Ho. We've loved and appreciated you for years. You've single-handedly built the Blog Aladdis empire, <laughs> and you're the modern-day face of Pilates for millions of people. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Pyle Kadakia, you're the founder and businesswoman behind ClassPass. You're not even five feet tall, as you point out yourself, and that hasn't stopped you from becoming such a huge success. As a short person myself, I find this incredibly inspiring. Thank you for having me. Lita Lewis, you quit your job in corporate America to dedicate yourself to fitness. You've been very open about your struggle with depression and how strength training has had such a positive impact on your mental health. That's so brave and bold. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany Vest, you're better known as Fitty Britty, and you're a health and wellness blogger who's lost 86 pounds and dedicated yourself to healthy living and becoming a yoga instructor. Hi, thank thanks you. for having me. Thank you for sharing your journey and being here. Welcome again, and thank you to all of you. Let's start with the roundtable discussion. Okay, all right, let's do it. All right, so Livestrong has always had the goal of helping real people of all body types become the very best versions of themselves. Because this is important to us, we'd like to ask, what does being body positive mean to you? And we'll start with you, Lita. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to body positivity, one would assume we're talking about the physical self. Uh, for me personally, I think more it being a mental thing. Because uh, in my own personal journey, having come from depression, I realized it was my mental state of mind and what I thought about myself that then essentially shaped how I looked. So again, for me, my, when my mind is strong and healthy, um, I find that I am positive and, and love my body in whatever shape that it may be in at any time. And Brittany, what does body positive mean to you? So for me, body positivity and being body positive, it's such a journey and just so you know different for every single person. But for me, it's about being happy with myself every day and working towards being happy every day. And you know, just being, you know, okay with not being okay some days. And you know, looking at yourself and knowing that not everything has to be perfect you know, all the time, but just loving yourself for all the work you're putting in and yeah, just loving your body for how it is in that moment every single day because we're never the same. Every day we wake up a little mm -hmm. bit different and yeah. you just have to love that about yourself. So yeah, that's what it means to me. That's mm -hmm. excellent. <laughs> Cassie, why don't you tell us what body positive means to you? So I completely agree with both of these ladies that body positivity is a mental thing, but I wanted to bring up something that happened the other day on social media. Um, somebody made a comment saying that you're not being body positive because you make fitness videos. Oh Crazy, right? Because we have a few fitness instructors here at the yeah. table. And I think making fitness videos, especially with the mindset that we do them, which is about getting stronger, getting healthier, is one of the most body positive things you could do. Oh, yeah. And I think sometimes those comments come from a place of maybe self-hatred or something else. Because just because I, I make a video that says perky booty doesn't mean that <laughs> I'm saying you have a flat butt and you need to perk it up. It just means like, hey, here's how to get stronger and right. perk up your butt if you want to. But it has nothing to do with how, how not perfect you look or whatever because like you said no no one no one is perfect we're all here trying to be the best versions of ourselves so i just wanted to bring that up yeah. because i think sometimes people get they kind of twist the word body positivity around and it really bothers me a lot yeah, <laughs> yeah. you make a great point with that anna 
Tell me, how has social media affected the way that you see your body? I, uh, you know, this is a really good question because I feel like I started out on my fitness journey actually really um, liking my body. You know, I didn't start working out because I didn't like the way I looked. It was about my health. And because of that reason, like it was really hard for me to like totally put myself out there and get out of my comfort zone. Cause I'm like, I look fine, you know, I don't need to do this. But it, because it was for my health, it, you know, took that time in the beginning to realize, oh, this actually does make me feel better. So sharing my journey in the beginning um, through social media, I started in a place of feeling very confident. But as things went on, I kind of, you know, there's so many beautiful women on social media, some naturally, some not, yeah. you know, and you never know what, which one is which. And mm -hmm. there, it almost is like getting into social media kind of made me second guess my confidence mm -hmm. and, you know, the way I saw myself because there is that comparison factor. And, you know, it took me a while of kind of needing to be like, you know, she's beautiful. That doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. or it doesn't mean that, you know, because that is her body that I need to look that way. I can appreciate my body for what it is. And so it was kind of interesting for me to start from a place where I actually was happy and then go to a place where it was like, oh, well, mm, you know, do I, I don't look that good, you know, or she, you know, et cetera. The whole comparison game, which can be really toxic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's kind of what inspired me to share one of my photos of the sitting versus standing. Um, because it was like, you know, every day I would take selfies and pose and I would feel great and confident in those moments and share it. But I knew that that was only a, a little tiny, you know, five seconds of me posing and that young women and women of all ages and men too, they don't know that that is that posing five second moment. And I wanted to share the other side so that people who might be in that same mind space that I was in before know okay, actually, she doesn't look like that all the time. I don't need to compare myself because that's not reality. You know, there's this other side to social media. Um, so I feel like that was almost therapeutic for me mm -hmm. to kind of put out there and to say, you know, I don't look like this perfect Instagram model all the time, and that's okay. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that from you. When I look at you, I see a perfect Instagram model. <laughs> 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 I'm all done up. You don't, you don't see the behind the scenes. <laughs> Brittany, tell me, how has social media affected the way that you see your body? So I was always a very confident person as well, um, even when I was um, technically overweight. And I, when I started my social media, I actually had it in secret because um, I was nervous about people in my real life seeing my body in the way that I was showing it. And um, I kind of had to get over that really quickly because people started finding it. And at first I became very like self-conscious and worried and I was nervous to post and I got over that real quickly. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, I realized I was, my showing my body to all these people who wanted to see it was helping so many people and to me, that still means everything. I, I just feel like it's just so important for other people who are going through something to kind of like see a body who's done it and, ha and know that there's someone else who's been in their shoes or going through their struggles. And so for me, it just made me feel even more confident about my body. And the world that I'm in, I've had, I've been very lucky to not ever been, had mean comments thrown my way about my body. Uh, everyone is just so supportive and it just makes me feel even better. Like it's such a, social media for me is such a positive space and it just, it's amazing for my body confidence and it's been a real like tool that I've been able to use. Um, and yeah, I just, I think it's been a really great thing for me. And, you know, the comparison game is definitely out there, but I tell, you know, myself and other people all the time that just like you said, like it's just a little blip of someone's life. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why the Instagram stories and Snapchat and like that kind of stuff is just amazing because you get to see another part of someone's life instead of just one little quick picture. Because yeah, everyone wants to look their best, right? You know, uh, on their Instagram page. But you know, 
When I sit down in my bikini when I'm in Hawaii or on the beach in Santa Monica, I don't have a flat stomach. I have rolls. And I, you know, I'll show that on my Instagram sometimes. I'll show it on my stories. And either way, I feel good because I've worked hard in my body and I work every day at maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And there's no reason why, you know, social media should make it any different, you know, so. I love your attitude. Oh, thank you. It's so great to hear. Thank you. So we have to get to this one, which is what is the meanest thing that someone has ever said about your body? Pyle, let's start with you. The meanest thing uh, for me has probably been around my height. Um, I'm 4'11". Uh, I've mm -hmm. always been short uh, in my, you know, and I think one of the hardest things, it's, you know, it doesn't sound mean when some, when people call you short, but I think sometimes people would say it in a way that made me feel like I was incapable, mm -hmm. right? Or that, hey, like, I'll do that for you, or you could never do that, or, you know, and I think that message for me was something I had to fight through. I, you know, still fight through it in my life. And uh, the only way you can is by proving the opposite. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. how I think I've always set up my life. And I mean, you know, it, I always think back, I was short, but I also, I, there's like, there's a great thing in there too. Like I always got to sort of be in the front and like dance yeah. class or in, in <laughs> classes, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. without people sort of uh, kind of being mad yeah. about it. Like yeah. I always, I like being in the front because I feel like I can learn class better or learn to learn whatever exercise I'm doing better. And so, I don't know, I think it's the way you look at it, but I feel like now it's like a signature thing I wear, right? It's, it's my height, and I loved the moment where I stopped wanting to wear heels. Oh, oh that's so bold, I love that. Yeah, that's really cool. And you get to be the front in pictures as well. Exactly. So it's nice. <laughs> Cassie, yeah. I've seen some of your blog posts about mm -hmm. this topic. What is the meanest thing that someone's ever said to you about your body? Um, well, seeing that I've been on YouTube since 2009, I've had a lot of mean things said about my body, which is crazy because when I went on YouTube to upload my first video, it was to teach Pilates. It wasn't to be a fitness model or something with flat abs. Like it was literally just to teach. Um, and you know, people would say like, oh, why don't you have a six pack? Why isn't your butt bigger? Like literally just got this yesterday. But the meanest thing anyone has ever said to me is, you don't care about your job enough or else you would lose some weight. Yeah. Because yeah, when you start attacking terrible. my career, my work ethic, based on my physicality, like that is just low. It, that made me really upset. And so that was actually the comment that gave me the fire to do one of my most, um, I think it's my most viral video, The Perfect Body, yeah, where I actually I took, that. yeah, <laughs> where I took real comments took other name. And then I said, well, what would I look if I molded myself to yeah. what they wanted me to look like? So thank you, person, because yeah. you gave me my best video. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Can I ask if that was a man or a woman? Do you know the gender of who left that comment? Um, I don't know. I, I, I just remember the feeling it gave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but going back on your question real quick, I just watched this entire series on Queen Victoria from the 1800s. She was also a smaller woman, but what I loved was that she had such a big personality and was such a leader. Yeah. So I, I, I see. You, you were like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anna, why don't you tell us about some of the meaner comments that people have made about your body? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, take your pick. <laughs> you know, people, they, will always have, it's almost kind of like whatever they're the most conscious about in themselves, that's what they critique on you the most. But they, that may not be what I'm concerned with or you know, focusing on. But if I were to say a comment that I've received multiple times that really upsets me, and it's, it's not so much that it's about me, it's more the mentality. Um, and this is a little bit personal, but um, you know, I shared a transformation. I've been working really hard lately, and you know, wanting to increase my strength, not mm -hmm. not going after a certain look or weight, but I've been wanting to get stronger, you know, improve my endurance, etc. And that does reflect itself in a physical form. Um, that's not the priority, but it happens. And I shared, you know, my progress, and but more talking about the mental and emotional aspects. But a lot of people, all they wanted to say was, "Well, your breast got smaller." your butt got smaller. Like, you know, what was the point of all of that? 
women are not defined by their chest size or the size of their bottom or mm -hmm. any other physical aspect. And for people to diminish my effort of how strong I felt, of how much more confident I am, not because of how I look, but because of my abilities that I've been able to you know, achieve over this last year, that was really upsetting for me because women are, you know, not just myself, but other women are being told that, you know, well, your effort wasn't that good because you don't look this way or you lost mm -hmm. this or you gained that. And I don't think that's acceptable. And I think that um, I ended up doing another follow-up post, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sharing like, yeah. you guys, like, you know, I am not defined by the way any part of my body looks or doesn't look. And that it's about the strength and the confidence and the mental and emotional benefits that come with this journey. And so I think that that's probably one of the meanest comments that's not just about me, but about the way that people perceive women in mm -hmm. general. It's so frustrating to hear. It's like if we're not shamed for one thing, we're shamed for something else. It's either we're too curvy, we're not curvy enough, we're too muscular, we're too short, we're too tall. It's like, you know, you're working out too much, you're getting too thick, or you're getting too thin. Like there's never a point where people don't leave us alone or just accept us as we are. Sometimes it feels that way. Can I add something to that? Of course. I think it's really important that we all sort of stay undefined. I think in general, you know, we like to be put in boxes, whether mm. it's titles of any sort. Mm. And we all need to, you know, I think that's something that ends up getting put into what we look yeah. like, but it also happens in other ways. Like, oh, you're a mom or you're not a mom mm. or you're, you're like, you know, you're, you're married, you're not married. It's all these like societal things that people put on us and our bodies, which we all need to just erase and just be who we want to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like isn't that. it interesting that it always seems to fall to women? Like, yes, especially, absolutely. Like, have you ever heard a man? They're like, "When are you gonna have kids?" No. Well, like, one no of the things, ever. one of the things I always look at is if you look at Instagram and the way women like to put their profiles. Like, we always put t like our titles and like, you know, like, oh, I like founder of this. Like, do this. And if you look at like most most guys, like they just don't write anything. Mm. And so we tend to actually talk about ourselves in these titles mm -hmm. um, when, when a, you know, I don't know if it's males or females, but we tend to define ourselves that way. And then I think the world ends up seeing us that way. You're right, because the way that men are just like, I'm, you know, I'm Joe, and that's who I am, and, <laughs> and it's like, like us. Yeah. And like, women are like, I'm this, 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 and then they're like, yep, yeah, it's never good. Right. And then it also forces you to not be able to change, and I think we all change, and oh, we change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, wait, but I just told the world I was this, or you know, and, or you feel constrained. Absolutely. I'm glad you jumped in with that because that was a really good point. That's good. Yeah. Cassie, why don't you tell us about the turning point where you realized that there was no such thing as the perfect body? I remember this point very clearly. I was wearing a sparkly leopard bikini <laughs> <laughs> and I walked on stage in clear heels and, and was being judged by like eight different 40 year old men. <laughs> This is a bikini competition. Wow. So I, um, back in 2012, I really wanted to push myself physically. And I had been teaching for a long time. I was like, oh, well, how much more muscly could I get? How much weight could I lose? I'm just like curious for myself. So I, I found out there was this thing called a bikini competition. I was like, that seems cool. Like, I'll just do that. And so I hired a trainer, um, literally worked out like four to five hours a day, ate a thousand calories. It was bad. I lost so much yeah. weight so fast. And my body started sculpting and just this thing that I had always dreamed of having. Um, and as I was sharing the journey on my blog, I would get comments, like fans were excited, but there were certain fans who were like, well, you're never gonna win this competition because your boobs aren't big enough or your butt isn't big enough. And it's my genetics. I don't have a big butt, I just don't. I'm Asian. Um, well, well, I think maybe some Asians have bigger butts, but mo most, or I at least do not. Um, and a lot of times when girls slim down for such an event, they do get implants so, because you're fat, it, you lose yeah, it from your yeah. boobs. So I, I wasn't gonna do that. And so I stepped on stage feeling pretty good about my body. But then once I started seeing all these other girls who were like really like, mm, like really fit and they were just so voluptuous at the same time, I started to lose my confidence. And um, I also didn't score very well that day. And I had worked so hard to get there. And I was like, wait, what am I trying to achieve? What is this perfect body? Is it the opinion of these eight 40 year old men? Is it my opinion? Is the girl's opinion? And I realized I was also very unhappy. I was hungry. Um, I was being really mean to my boyfriend at the time. And I was being, I was kind of like cloudy in my head because yeah. I wasn't getting enough nutrients. So I just like wasn't being normal Cassie. And I realized that <laughs> the perfect body or what I thought was a perfect body wasn't actually what I wanted. What I wanted was 
a harmony between my lifestyle and my physical body. Um, so I would say that was the turning point for me. And um, it took me years to get out of that mentality because I would look at apples or bananas and be completely terrified of them because I thought they would make me fat. Like I literally thought that. Um, and so I would just work out even harder. I would eat even less. And my body literally became like a sponge even if I ate regular healthy stuff, I just started ballooning up mm. past my original weight. And so my body was like, Cassie, do not ever do that again. And yeah. so actually um, it was with class pass that I started finding the joy in working out again because mm. I had always been training it's other people. Here. Yeah, no, seriously. And then the personal trainer just, you know, kind of wrecked me. But I was able to discover new classes on class pass and it just mm. has really made it fun. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for it's changed my that. life too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to hear how we can all have positive impacts on each other. So I'm really glad you mentioned that to Pyle too. Mm -hmm. Anna, what was the moment when you had a turning point where you realized there was no such thing as the perfect body? I would say it wasn't any one particular moment, but a compilation of you know experience and different moments through my life. Um, I was you know raised in the United States, and we have this standard of beauty, and you know it's very um, you know curvy, and also to be very bronzed and. Um, my first experience living outside the United States was in China. So I moved to China for a year right after college. And there, you know, white skin is beautiful. And, you know, I was always spray tan, spray tan, spray tan, be darker, you know, and going there and they were like, you know, don't, don't do spray tans, you know, just, uh, you know, wh skin whitening products, you know, there's another market. It's, yeah. it's just the other direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really interesting for me to see a different culture that valued something totally opposite to what I was raised in. Then we moved to Italy and I lived there for three years. My husband's Italian and there they love skinny legs. And for me, I like, you know, I, it's always, okay, curvy legs, you know, grow your butt, you know, uh -huh. squats. And, um, you know, and it was interesting because people would compliment me, oh, your legs are so skinny. And I would say, don't tell me that, you know, like I've been working so hard in the gym to get strong, you know. And, you know, it was kind of like seeing these different cultures, you know, the U.S., China, Italy, and so many others, they all have their own version of beauty. None of them matter. And none of them are the you know, standard of beauty for any one individual. If you just happen to be born into that culture where that is what they think is beautiful, it doesn't mean that that's what's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, the stroke of luck of wherever you were born. Mm -hmm. And we tend to kind of take on the standard of beauty in our culture and think that we have to be defined by that, but we don't. And there's so many different versions, and it kind of takes that time to see the different cultures and standards of beauty to realize none of them are correct. You know, there it's just it's subjective, you know, mm -hmm. and it it comes down to whatever you define, you know, beauty within yourself. Mm -hmm. It's great that you mentioned that about it matters where we were born and what culture. And it's also mm -hmm. like the time is different, too. So remember, mm -hmm. like in the 1920s, mm -hmm. the flappers were very flat chested yeah, boy body. Right. Boy and body. then in the 50s, yes. it was like uh -huh. the total you had yeah. to have the hourglass Hers. shape. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't even know what time we're living in. It's oh, the time we're like, in the what even? But we're creating the body positivity era. That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's, That's true. Right. Very we true. are going to yeah. change yes. the face of this. So yes. no one, no young girls are going to have <laughs> right. to go through hopefully what we all went yes. through. That's my right. goal. So I'm perfection. Right. Yeah. I am yeah. perfection. Yeah. I am perfection. I love that. And I love that our hashtag could be seen as imperfection, but we choose to see it as I am perfection. And that's that's a lot of what we're all about here yeah. today, too. That's clever. Yeah. Yeah. Perspective. <laughs> True perspective. Yeah, yeah. it's all about right. perspective. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Pyle, why don't you tell us what the turning point was for you when you realized that there was n no such thing as the perfect body? So I've been a dancer since I was three years old, right? And uh, when you're a dancer, your body is your vehicle, mm -hmm. and it is your form of expression. And I think there is a double-edged sword with that. It's this beautiful vehicle, right, that helps you achieve um, art and being able to express what's inside of you. But at the same time, there is a lot of, you know, this is what your body should look like. Here's, you know, you should make sure you're, especially before a performance, like make sure you get down to the, this weight. Um, and I think I went through a lot of that being a performer myself. And I actually remember there was a turning point for me. Um, I had actually been, I got maced and mugged uh, sitting at a Starbucks in, uh, in New York City. And this oh was gosh. about six years ago. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because I, you know, have created ClassPass, which is completely about fitness. 
And I actually, at that point, like had, you know, I started a class pass out of my passion for dance. I actually wasn't into many fitness classes at the time. Mm -hmm. And to get over that, I actually started taking class. And I don't think anything inside of me or outside of me changed, aside from the fact that I started taking class and I got stronger. And I started having muscle. And being a dancer my whole life, I was, I was agile and I was lean, but I wasn't, I wasn't muscular. And I started really actually developing muscles and tone. And I think what was so amazing to me in that moment was that I realized I could control it. And I think like just knowing that if I worked hard enough at it, like for me personally, I could achieve whatever body I wanted. And in that way, I don't actually care what the perfect body is because it didn't matter. But it was this idea of, okay, like, yeah, if you work out eight hours a day, you can, everyone can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think just knowing that and unleashing that in my body was like an empowering point of you. And then it was kind of like, well, what's gonna make me happy? Cause that's the only thing that matters. And being a dancer, I think one of the coolest things is I get to express who I am through my body. And you know, I think we actually all do that even in fitness, right? I mean, at the end of the day, when you're a teacher, you're using your body to share something with the world. And you're not just sharing what you look like, you are sharing something deep inside of you. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is everybody, we should, we should really honestly, like the more people who are smiling in the world, like to me that is body positivity and, and that exuding, um, exuding side of it. Lita, I wanna know, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome to achieve self-acceptance? Oh, that's such a loaded question because it's been a whole lifetime, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Self-acceptance, I think, is definitely a journey and a process. Um, I accept myself every morning in order to be able to achieve um, great things and accomplish what I need to do. I think in hindsight, um, and I never used to love talking about this. It, it actually burdens me even to this day. I, I, I need to step away for the fact that, you know, depression is not essentially a weakness, um, but an illness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it was caused by the most, I shouldn't say ridiculous, because I know a lot of women can relate, but it was heartbreak, I, you know. Mm -hmm. But I was depressed um, five, five years ago, and it, um, it shattered everything. And I remember, Having to dis detach this idea of, of an image of a life, um, family members, his becoming mine, um, and literally just having to look at my not life as solo. And I never essentially did that because I attached so much of myself to this person and creating this image of a life or in a future that obviously was not going to happen. Um, heartbreak um, changed everything for me. I was working corporate America. Um, and my life described, I don't know if we're familiar with Devil Wears Prada, mm -hmm. but I almost say my life was pretty much like that. I worked directly for our CEO and founder, and my life was insane and did a lot of crazy things. Um, so between a very hectic job um, and a relationship that's just dissolved very quickly, I spent out of control. I lost my appetite, so I lost a whole lot of weight, almost 30 pounds in a matter of 90 days, and almost unrecognizable. Um, for me, self-acceptance was a journey that took about 18 months from that point. I took some time off work. I traveled the world solo, um, essentially with a backpack on my back and tra uh, traveling like off the beaten path. So not like a tourist, but really sort of like immersing myself in different cultures. And it was then I was uh, you know, exposed to different types of people, religions, where I saw you know, women unable to feed their children and it made me look myself in the mirror and realize there is so much more to this life than heartbreak and a man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, duh. So, you live and you learn. And between um, you know, a lot of self-help reading, um, journaling, um, being really kind to myself um, changed a lot. And it's in that process of then finding this new life of fitness um, and honoring my body and, and making it stronger and, and what I thought was the idea of perfection at the time um, was my turning point in realizing there, that is self-acceptance. This is where you are. It was depression. It is now a journey out of depression um, and to honor that. And I think that's, that was my moment there. That was actually a moment of 18 months before I could actually really stand strong in my true self um, and be essentially self-diagnosed and then self-healed. Um, so that was what it was for me. That is so strong and so brave. 
So this one pile is for you. Pyle, if you could go back and talk to yourself, how old were you when you needed the most reassurance mm -hmm. and what would you say to you at that age? Let's see. Um, when I was younger, uh, I actually got made fun of for my ethnicity, mm. for being Indian. I mean, I grew up in a town where there wasn't anyone else that looked like me. And that was actually an interesting struggle, right? Because I had to, I had to, I was by myself and I think people didn't know how to understand like what I look like or I had dark hair or, you know, just I look different. Um, and I think one of the things I learned to do over time was actually share my culture and the beauty of it with them and everything that I believe is, is precious to my parents, my heritage, my ancestors. Um, and I think that was a really important part of the journey that I went through. What was the exact age where that happened? So I was about five years old oh, wow. uh, when that happened. That's I think so I young. almost uh, left school. Like I actually like didn't want to go to school because of it. And wow. but I think like in the face of that, and I think about adversity and everything we're always going to face. I think it taught me one of the most important things, which was in the face of adversity, just mm -hmm. learn to override it and learn to share and give versus kind of run away from it. And I think mm -hmm. that's how I've approached everything else in my life. I think it'll be so surprising to people that it's such a young age where these kinds of things start to impact a person five Seven. years old. Anna, how about you? What was the time and the age where you felt like you needed the most reassurance and what would you have said to yourself at that age? Um, you know, I would say that kind of, you know, growing up, as I mentioned earlier in the U.S., where I thought I needed to be tan, I'm very fair-skinned naturally, um, and I, you know, I don't have the curvy bottom that everyone said that I, you know, should have or is the ideal. And with, you know, living in other countries, it was almost kind of in those moments where in the beginning it was like, wait, so I, I can love myself naturally as I am with my fair skin? And in Italy, like, oh, you know, they, I'm being complimented for something that I'm not used to being able to accept, you know? I didn't know that it was okay to love my body for how it is naturally, and I think it was almost in those moments in kind of the early days of social media where it was like, okay, but I have this idea, I need to conform to these standards, and I would say it's probably the most, the more recent times in my life. It actually wasn't even so much when I was younger, it was more as a young adult, you know, and kind of seeing all the, you know, what I'm being told I should look like or that I should do to change my body when it's like, you know, I just need to be told that I can love my body the way it is. And if I want to work out because I want to feel stronger, then I can love that version of my body, whatever it ends up looking like. So would you say it's sort of late teens, early 20s? I would say early 20s. Early yeah. 20s. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of yeah. people will be surprised about that as well because a lot yeah. of people are used to hearing 13's the toughest age and here right. we have Pyle saying five. Yeah, and well, and you know, on that note, something that I think is really important that Brittany and I were discussing earlier is that I was raised by a single father mm -hmm. and I did not have a mother figure you know, around. Um, mm. And I grew up with m my brother really closely as well and so I never had anyone poking at my appearance. Wow. Never. Wow. And so, and I feel like that's why as a young teen, I, I never thought anything of it, you know, of how I looked. And I speak to other women who say they have a completely opposite experience and that a mother telling their daughter that she needs to lose weight or look a certain way has, you know, contributed to their insecurities or to them thinking that they need to look a certain way. And so I think that's another really important conversation that needs to be had that as, you know, adult women, we need to be conscious of how we're speaking to our daughters and to, you know, the young, the little girls around us. And really it's about not speaking about our appearance at all, you know, not saying, oh, you look great. Did you lose weight? Because then they attach importance to, okay, then oh, I look good because I've lost weight, you know, and kind of, you know, just the overall importance and connection to how our, how we look. Um, I think that aside from body positivity, as, as you know, women, there's a much bigger conversation connecting it to how we have that conversation with, with younger women as well. That's an excellent point that you make, and I think it's for moms, because right. from what Lita told me earlier too, when your mom tells you, you're good enough, you go, you, you, know, you don't need to spend all this time getting ready, yeah. it's a different thing, or somebody saying like, right, like what you said, oh, you lost weight and you look better, but I think it's also about our friends on social media, yeah, yeah. and I catch myself yeah, doing this right. all the time, like, oh, I love your you hair, you change it, but it's like, 
people don't have to change their hair to look right. beautiful yeah. or like get their makeup done. Yeah. We, right? we should be able to com compliment each yeah. other. There's Compliments nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with, you know, like I think wanting to look good. You know, mm -hmm. we all want to look good. And it's, I think that that's okay. It's just when you go beyond the point where you touch so much importance to the mm -hmm. way that you look, mm -hmm. you know, that's where we need to kind of be sure to keep ourselves in check too. I actually have a funny story with that. When I, when I was younger in our towns, there were all these like Indian beauty pageants that would happen. <laughs> it like became this thing and it was terrible because it was like run by all males. And mm. it was like, you know, it was this beauty pageant and my dance teacher, my mom were like, we want to like sign you up. Like, you know, they were like, you're a great dancer, great. And I was like, no, I was like, I'm going to create a name for myself one day, but I'm mm. going to do it based on my intelligence. Yeah. And I was yes. very clear about that since I was really young. But, and, and I didn't know what I was going to end up doing, but I feel like I look back on that and I'm like, I'm really glad I was able to do that because I don't know what I would have become. Yeah. That's such a great story. And I think something that, you know, we could all tell so many of the young women in our lives and also share on social media that it's about, yeah, more than how we look, but it's who we are and what we're bringing to the world and Absolutely. that intelligence. Yeah. I like your note on, uh, Growing up without a mom and having less body image issues, yeah. that's so interesting because you would think that to have a mother figure, you would have more guidance in life. But it's yeah. I look back now and I, I feel like maybe some of my insecurities come from my mom because she grew up very thin and everything. Mm -hmm. She would look at me as a, I grew up chubby, and she would look at me and be like, why are you so fat? Like, you can't even fit into my jeans when I was 18, and I was like 12 or something. Like, how does that make me feel? Um, but back then, you know, you're a kid, you're like, oh, I don't know. Like, maybe I should just eat less or something like that. But it's really interesting you brought that up because it's almost like the women, in addition to the men, are perpetuating this right, issue. Yeah, right. So not talking about it and making it about your yeah. skill and your talent yeah. is what we need to do. Right. Um, but also, in terms of culture stuff, in the Asian culture, yeah. a lot of times people just say it as a conversation starter, like, right. oh, you look a little fat. Like, <laughs> here, eat some more, which is yeah. really weird, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Like no, seriously, comments. seriously. Wow. Yeah. 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 Whenever like you're going to India, like it's like either someone's going to be like, you lost weight or you gained weight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's never an in-between. Right. No. I agree. Yeah. It's like, it's it makes you not, I mean, I always think about this with the holidays, too, mm -hmm. because I feel like people are always like scared with their family. Uh -huh. It's like, why? Because you know people are going to judge you yeah. for your Right. For sure, yes. and so either way, not a good sentiment. And either way, they tell you to eat more anyway. So yeah, because yeah, if you exactly. don't, then it's right, that's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. here's the eighth serving. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I grew up in the food. opposite culture yeah. where even my size, what I think is pretty normal for myself, uh -huh. was like get too thin, eat more. Yeah. Oh, so it's yeah. you know, Polynesian people show love with food. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's essentially my mother's side. So it's funny to hear that because my mother, as I was telling Jess, is very tough love. Mm -hmm. She raised three girls on her own, so wow. this idea of sort of getting ready for an event or something where we would just literally fight for some mirror space in the bathroom <laughs> and spend hours, and my mom would literally like throw brushes out the door and be like, get you're in. good enough, get in the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's over. So it's, yeah. I think it's a, such a blessing now in hindsight yeah. to realize I had a mother mm -hmm. that sort of gave us this idea of you're enough, mm -hmm. let's go, let's get yeah. on with oh. life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a much bigger discussion than, than a one question for all of us because I find I'm very passionate about young women because in a time where it really is the Kardashian era, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and I speak really dearly to say the minority communities, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of what it looks like to be beautiful um, and, and perfect, to, and I guess it's subjective also, but it's very cartoonish or, or almost mm -hmm. so surreal that it's becoming a, a normal the normalcy of it really frightens me because I feel like in 10 years' time from now, what does that look like for our young girls, mm -hmm. um, essentially who are going to be in this space that, that replace us? And so it's so important to really understand the messaging that mothers or even fathers and, and siblings um, all have a role in this idea of um, who we are and our self-worth, but yeah. goes yeah. way beyond the physical mm -hmm. self. Absolutely. Um, so I think it's a really important conversation. And I too, I've never met somebody that was essentially raised by a father, a single father mm -hmm. and yeah. with a brother, mm -hmm. because yeah. and how that may shape you. So mm -hmm. it's right. it's a really interesting so story. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is really weird, the impact that moms have. I was yeah. talking to a 20-something this morning, and her mom, like, looked at her bag and said, oh, you have to get rid of that fake Louis Vuitton bag. Like, it was just, like, the judgments that, like, a mom might make based yeah. on brands, labels, what you're wearing, how you look. Yeah. And the whole point that 
um, a lot of you made about how in certain cultures when people are like, you've gained weight, you've lost weight, we have to think too that it has only been a generation since a lot of people in many places in the world and in the US mm -hmm. haven't had enough to eat. So it like I think was a better thing to be a little bit having thicker right. cheeks and being a little chubby because it showed like mm. you're getting enough, you're being nourished and all yeah. of that. So that's an interesting topic too yeah. is that yeah, we're deep. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. deep, and we're finally in an age where like most people feel like they have enough and more than enough, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. then that becomes the problem we're over. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brittany, I'm going to go to you. Okay. So we're all looking for inspiration everywhere. Is there somebody or um, a few people on Instagram that you follow who inspire you? Well, all these ladies are Aww. big inspirations to me, so everyone right here. But also, I mean, Ashley Graham is probably like a very, mm -hmm. like, popular answer but she I just love like her authenticity and like I love watching her stories I love seeing all her successes and how confident she is and her like personality shine and like everything she does and also um, I follow someone um, named Shanae Alexander who we have very similar weight loss stories and she's just so she lives in New York she's like so cool and like she just has amazing things to say about all the things we're talking about too. And mm -hmm. she just motivates me, you know, and she ha starts conversations. I just love conversation starters, people who get you thinking about, you know, stuff that maybe you're thinking about, but you're in your head about it, right? And it's just, it's not coming out or you're not discussing it with your friends. But having like someone online to like, who is also talking about the things that you're thinking about and just being able to have a conversation with them. Um, I mean, I've never met either of those people before, but just, being able to follow, you know, everyone at this table and just all the people I've never met, but who are just inspirations and who are confident and everyone's just doing their own things and they're all amazing. And it's just so cool, like, to know that there's just all this space in the world for all this success and for everyone to shine and be who they're supposed to be and to be able to see, like, watch that. So... I'm glad you mentioned Shanae. I, have, I haven't followed yeah. her yet, so I will look her up yeah, now that you mentioned cool. her. Yeah. Cassie, how about you? Who do you look to online, perhaps on Instagram, who inspires you and motivates you? My community motivates me, the fans, because from the very beginning, they were the ones who asked me for the second YouTube video, who asked me for merchandise. And so when you live to serve, um, it creates more of an enriching experience. And so for me, that feedback, bad or good, that comes right away, like that's what I really thrive off of. As, as long as the fans are happy and like I feel like I'm continuing to grow, like that's where I find my inspiration. Excellent. How about you, Anna? Yeah, actually the same. So there's um, one person, well, there's many, many, many women in my community who are very inspiring, but um, I've really connected with one girl in particular. Her name is Farah, and she's technically overweight. And, but she's been on this journey, and most importantly, to body positivity and body acceptance beyond, you know, weight loss. Um, but she shared that at no point in her journey, she's seen great success, you know, um, mentally, emotionally, and physically. But she shared that at no point in her journey did she say and look at herself, you don't look good. She said, every day I look in the mirror and I say, you're doing good. You know, and I loved that. You know, it's just so amazing to see someone who maybe society doesn't accept you for being beautiful, but she is. She's a very beautiful person inside and out. And when I saw her kind of lead by example, you know, for other women to see that, I just, that was so inspiring for me. And I think for so many women, and I think that it's, that's why it's important to share those moments and those feelings so that other women can see it is okay to love myself at any point in my journey. So mm -hmm. definitely um, I get inspiration from my community, from, you know, your, your women that are just mothers, you know, they are um, business women, you know, students, all of the above, you know, and that are just kind of going through this thing we call life and figuring out how to love themselves in the process and through all the ups and downs. Excellent. We get a lot of uh, inspiration at Livestrong from our Livestrong community as well. Anyone else want to take this question about who you are uh, motivated by on Instagram? Pile? So I have this, I've always actually looked for quotes. Like it's a really important part of actually my daily process that I've had. I feel like if you can sort of start your intention with like a good thought. Um, so I love scouring for good quotes. Um, and I actually tend to find them 
from other, like I feel like other, you know, other leaders, bosses, or other people who are just like from Tori Birch to Jessica Alba, Sophia mm -hmm. Moroso. I feel like that feeling of goodness that we're all kind of like, let's start mo like Monday in a good way, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. is just so inspiring. And I, I love finding those like little quotes or like little sayings that you wouldn't have read yeah. mm -hmm. if like you weren't scrolling through through yeah. Instagram. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my god, like this is. <laughs> Just such a sweet thought mm -hmm. for like one second and then it's out, but it sort of changes your day. So I really look for quotes like that on Instagram. I thought long and hard about that one actually um, because I'm, I've been taught, um, my mother said always to start within. So a lot of you know, self-motivation and inspiration has, has been trying to find it here and not externally because these things fall off, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, mom. So um, <laughs> I, I didn't know how to answer that and I keep thinking of this one person and it was so unpredictable for me because there's a lot of things I disagree with one's personal lifestyle which is out of my business so um, it's Cardi B oh, interesting yeah. right because yeah. like you, you look at this character and she you know yeah. would use certain language um, yeah. chooses to live her life a certain way um, some of which I just don't agree with at all but what I do find really inspiring about her is that not only has she have a colossal platform um, many, many different demographics and ages follow her. And her pure and raw honesty about everything, um, relationships, her body, um, you know, the enhancements she's had, and how she speaks in a language that perhaps people can identify with. <laughs> I am very inspired by that. And then I ask, me, ask myself why, because I don't necessarily want to sort of bring that to the table. But I, th I said, where I came up with this idea that I was inspired by it because I haven't got the bravery to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we speak of body positivity and being confident, and I believe I'm still in that process. Like, I want my Instagram to look as, as, as pretty as possible, and I'm, I'm not too afraid to at least admit that. Um, and sometimes in an IG story, I might set myself looking not so great, looking like a drowned rat after the, after the gym. But for, a, for a second there, I kind of think about it sometimes. Um, but then I look at people like Cardi B who are just completely raw and unfiltered, yeah. and I'm like, that's dope. I can, yeah. I, I can at least respect that. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I bring that up because one, I, I was at first kind of terrified to bring that up. Um, but I think she uh, can at least teach us something about true confidence mm -hmm. um, and being completely unfiltered um, with herself in her language. And that's something that I, I think I can respect. Yeah. That's a great perspective. <laughs> Thank you all for being a part of this roundtable discussion. I think what we're doing is incredibly important because we are going to be trying to change this for the women who are coming up after us and for all of our friends and ourselves as well. So mm -hmm. this is a great talk that we had today and I appreciate all of you sharing all of your stories and your time with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.